Welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 19 video, um, video 1, Confidence Intervals for Proportions. Both of the sampling distributions we've looked at are normal. For proportions, the standard deviation of p hat is the square root of pq over n, and for means, the standard deviation for y bar is equal to sigma over square root of n. When we don't know p or sigma, we're stuck, right? Nope. We will use the sample statistics to estimate these population parameters. Whenever we estimate the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we call it a standard error. For a sample proportion, the standard error is se p hat equals square root of p hat times q hat over n. For the sample mean, the standard error is standard error of y bar equals x over square root of n. Recall that the sampling distribution model of p hat is centered at p with a standard deviation of square root of pq over n. Since we don't know p, we can't find the true standard deviation of the sampling distribution model, so we will need to find the standard error. And this is the case most of the time. When we um, actually look at a set of data and get the p hat value, most of the time we don't know what p is. We're trying to estimate the true population proportion based on what we see in our um, sample. And so since we don't know p and we're trying to estimate it, we use our estimate p hat to, fit, to calculate our standard error. So standard error of p hat is equal to the square root of p hat times q hat over n. By the 68.95.99.7 rule, we know that about 68% of all samples will have p hats within one standard error of p. About 95% of all samples will have p hats within two standard errors of p. And about 99.7% of all samples will have p hats within three standard errors of p. Well, we can look at this from p hats point of view. Consider the 95% level. There's a 95% chance that p is no more than two standard deviations away from p hat. So if we reach out two standard, de standard errors, I said standard deviation, standard errors away from p hat. So if we reach out two standard errors, we are 95% sure that p will be in that interval. In other words, if we reach out two standard errors in either direction of p hat, we can be 95% confident that the interval contains the true proportion. This is called a 95% confidence interval. So here we've got a little cartoon guy, um, Acme P trap guaranteed to capture P with 95% confidence. And it's showing you there, it's centered around p hat and then it goes two standard errors in either direction, and we can be 95% confident that the true population proportion is somewhere in that interval. So reaching out two standard errors on either side of a p hat makes us 95% confident we'll trap the true proportion p. So what does 95% confidence really mean? Each confidence interval uses a sample statistic to estimate a population parameter. In this case, we use p hat to estimate p. But since samples vary, the statistics we use and thus the, the confidence interval we construct vary as well. To show um, this, the figure to the right shows that some of our confidence intervals from 20 random samples capture the true proportion the green horizontal line, while others do not. So what this is, is showing is say that 20 different researchers gathered data and found uh, the sample proportion. Now, unknown to them, there's a, well, they know that there's a true population proportion. They just don't know what it is. And that is what the green line is. So we're, we're having special knowledge here. We're knowing what the true population proportion is. And here are all their little um, p hats. Right here, right here, right here. They go up and down. They're all over the place. Some are below the true proportion. Some are above. Okay. The little arms on this represent going two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below their particular p hat. So like this one, this first one here, 
it goes two standard deviations above, two standard deviations below, but it doesn't cross the green line, so it does not contain the true proportion. But the next several do, okay? Within their little extensions, the two standard errors on either side, it captures the true population proportion. So some of them, most of them do, a couple of them, I believe three, these two on top and then this one below, do not. Our confidence is in the process of constructing the interval, not in any one interval itself. Thus, we expect 95% of all 95% confidence intervals to contain the true parameter that they are estimating. So, if these are 95% confidence intervals, if we had thousands of them, just we kept repeating, 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 thousands of them, 95% of the intervals would capture the true proportion, and 5% would not. Okay, so that's what 95% confidence means, that if we keep using the same method, 95% of all the intervals produced will capture the true proportion. We can claim with 95% confidence that the interval p hat plus or minus 2 times the standard error of p hat contains the true population proportion. The extent of the interval on either side of p hat is called the margin of error, me. So in this case, our margin of error would be 2 times the standard error of p hat. So that's what the little extensions right here are. You've got your estimate, and then you've got your margin of error above, margin of error extending below. In general, confidence intervals have the form of estimate. That's what our p hat is, plus or minus margin of error. That's what our 2 times the standard error of p hat. The more confident one we want to be, the larger our margin of error needs to be, making the interval wider. The problem with that, with that is you lose precision, okay? So, for instance, here, here's our little guy from Acme, and it's the Acme P-trap, guaranteed to capture P. Now, with 99% confidence, they're saying it's improved, but in order to do that, we go not only two standard errors on either side of P-hat, we go three, so we get a much larger interval. So if you're trying to pinpoint a particular value, be precise, you're, you're losing precision there. But you are gaining confidence. To be more confident, we wind up being less precise. We need more values in our confidence interval to be more certain. Because of this, every confidence interval is a balance between certainty and precision. The tension between certainty and precision is always there. Fortunately, in most cases, we can be both sufficiently certain and sufficiently precise to make useful statements. That's what we want to do. We want to find kind of that balance that will give us enough certainty to be sufficiently confident and then enough precision to be able to make some sort of educated decision. And that's where the usefulness comes from. The choice of confidence level is somewhat arbitrary, but keep in mind this tension between your certainty and precision when selecting your confidence level. The most commonly chosen confidence levels are 90%, 95%, and 99%, but any percentage can be used. You could have a 92% confidence level, or a 97%, or an 80%. The 2 in p hat plus or, uh, plus or minus 2 times the standard error of p hat, our 95% confidence interval, came from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, which is a great empirical rule. It's a good rough estimate. Using a table or technology, we can find that a more exact value for our 95% confidence interval is 1.96 instead of 2. We call 1.96 the critical value and denote it z star. Okay, so that would be the multiplier for every 95% confidence interval. And so for 90% and for 99% um, you're, you're going to have different values. Uh, for any confidence level, we can find the corresponding critical value, the number of standard errors that corresponds to our confidence interval level. In fact, there's a table called Table T in the back of your book, and across the bottom, you'll find your Z stars, your, your critical values for Z. And up across the top, you'll find um, the confidence levels that correspond to those critical values. 
So for example, for a 90% confidence interval, the critical value is 1.645. Okay. So if we want to be 90% confident, we need to go 1.645 standard EV or standard errors in both directions away from our prediction. All statistical models um, make are made upon assumptions. Okay, so different models make different assumptions. If those models, if those assumptions are not true, the model might be inappropriate and our conclusions based on it may be wrong. That typo is going to drive me nuts. We'll say that. Okay, so they all make assumptions. Assumptions, remember, by their definition, can't be checked. You have to assume them. So what we do is we think about certain things and we check actual conditions. And if those conditions are upheld by the situation described, then it's reasonable to make our assumptions. If the assumptions are not true, the model might be inappropriate and our conclusions based on it may be wrong. Okay. So, you know, if, if we use normal calculations for a distribution that is decidedly not normal, our calculations are going to be meaningless. We've wasted our time. You can never be sure that an assumption is true, like I was saying earlier, but you can often decide whether an assumption is plausible, reasonable, by checking a related condition. Here are the assumptions and the corresponding conditions you must check before creating a confidence interval for a proportion. Independence assumption. We first need to think about whether the independence assumption is plausible. It's not one you can check by looking at the data. Instead, we check two conditions to decide whether independence is reasonable. So we kind of think about it, and then we check these two things. Randomization condition. Were the data sampled at random or generated from a properly randomized experiment? Proper randomization can help ensure independence. 10% condition. Is the sample size no more than 10% of the population? If that's the case, then if there's a little bit of a violation of independence, our sample size is still small enough that the probabilities aren't changing much, and so our calculations will still be reasonable. Sample size assumption. The sample needs to be large enough for us to be able to use the central limit theorem, the CLT. Remember, we check that by the success-failure condition. We must expect at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. When the conditions are met, we are ready to find the confidence interval for the proportion P. The confidence interval is P hat plus or minus Z star times the standard error of P hat, where the standard error of P hat is equal to the square root of P hat times Q hat over N. The critical value Z star depends on the particular confidence level C that you specify. Choosing your sample size. The question of how large a sample to take is an important step in planning any study. Choose a margin of error and a confidence interval level. The formula requires P hat, which we don't have yet because we have not taken this sample. A good estimate for P hat which will yield the largest value for the product p hat times q hat and therefore n is 0 0.50. So if you have nothing else to go on, just plug that in. Okay, so we solve the formula for n. Okay, you'll put in the margin of error, goodness, margin of error that you have chosen, and you will. Also plug in the 0.5 for p hat and q hat. Okay, The confidence level will have a particular z star go that goes with that. And so you will plug in for that. So you'll have a, a particular margin of error, a particular z star. You're going to do 0.5 times 0.5 for p hat times q hat. And so you'll be able to solve for n. Don't mistake what the interval means. That is the biggest thing of what can go wrong. Don't suggest that the parameter varies. The parameter is what it is. Our intervals will vary depending as we take one sample and then another sample and another sample. In repeated sampling, the interval would move around, but the parameter stays the same. Don't claim that other samples will agree with yours. Don't say 95% of the time we will get the same sample or we'll get the same 
interval. That's not true. Neither one of the statements are true. You'll get different samples and that they'll give you different p hats and so your intervals will change slightly. But 95% of those intervals produced will capture the parameter. Don't be certain about the parameter. We haven't found p, we found p hat. Don't forget the interval itself is about the parameter and not the statistic. We don't need to be 95% confident about the sample proportion. We know what the sample proportion is. We're 95% confident about the population proportion. Don't claim to know too much. And do take responsibility for the uncertainty. Okay, we're not 100, you know, we haven't calculated the population pro proportion. We do have a margin of error. And so there is some uncertainty. And do treat the whole interval equally. Margin of error can be too large to be useful. We can't be exact, but how precise do we need to be? Okay, we don't want too large of a margin of error. It wouldn't do anybody any good if they turned on the, the weather and the weatherman said, well, it's going to be somewhere between negative 22 degrees and 104 degrees today. Well, you know, that's great. I'm sure it will be here in Houston, but that's not really going to give us much information that we need. One way to make the margin of error smaller is to reduce your level of confidence, but they, that may not be a useful solution. You may need to be, you know, 97% confident in what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. You need to think about your margin of error when you design your study. This is the solution. To get a, a narrower interval without giving up confidence, you need to have less variability, and you can do this with a larger sample. Okay. Choosing your sample size. In general, the sample size needed to produce a confidence interval with a given a margin of error at a given confidence level is, okay, this formula agrees with the one we just talked about. It's just this one's solved for n. So whichever way you want to memorize it, you need to memorize it one way or the other, where me is isolated or where n is isolated. But n is going to equal the critical value squared, so z star squared times p hat times q hat over the margin of error squared, where z star is the critical value for your confidence level. To be safe, round up the sample size you obtain. So if you get 72.01, round up to 73. Violation of assumptions. Watch out for biased samples. Keep in mind what you learned in Chapter 12. Okay, the, the randomization part is really pretty important because it's going to give you good information about independence. Make sure you think about the independence. Also, always check that you're expecting at least um, 10 successes and 10, fail 10 failures. So if you don't know anything about P, use that P hat value and do N times P hat and N times Q hat. And make sure those are at least 10. All right, that's going to be it for video one. We're going to come back and work some examples in video two. I will see you then.